hello it's good to see you today and um, we're going to jump straight into this lesson uh, this this text from uh, the book of Ezekiel today one that we don't go to a whole lot and I hope that it's something that encourages you you know when our world has been messed up and we're not sure where we can go or or what we can do God's Word can give us direction and and so often we we don't think to go there we maybe think that the Bible deals with big issues or spiritual issues or uh, theological issues but not with everyday life and concerns and so uh, I hope that today uh, we can uh, see that there is a, a practical uh, purpose to scripture to reading it and, and to applying it to our lives the image I'm using for this short series is the word adrift and I, I think that it fits this time in not just this country but around the globe that it's just a, a period of, of pause for many of us um, and and that we can feel adrift as a lot of our familiar stability has been removed over the last six months whether it's as a consequence of the pandemic or maybe just looking at the world differently after the spotlight has again been shined on racism around the nation society has changed and there is no going back to the way it was there's going to be something new something different uh, in the future because of the experience that we're having right now the prophet ezekiel also experienced change a lot of change and he lived in Jerusalem when the the city was bustling full of life but then also when it was attacked and defeated by the Babylonians he was among those who marched the 600 or so miles from Jerusalem to Babylon and while the city of Jerusalem wasn't destroyed at that point in time, it, it, it was destroyed later, the first half of Ezekiel's book of prophecy in the Bible warned Israel that without radical repentance, the city would be destroyed. Like Jeremiah that we talked about last week, nobody listened to him and the city was destroyed. Ezekiel is a long book, again, not the longest, but a long book, and uh, it's a difficult read, but I think as we, we study it, as we get to, to know some of the background, some of the context, uh, that we can learn from it today, as it's written by somebody who is living in Babylon, living in exile, uh, and writing both to those there with him in his community and to those back in Jerusalem. Most of the prophetic writings that we have in our Bibles are usually addressed to nations as a whole or to the kings and leaders of those nations. And I think we can recognize some of the potential side effects of this. If you're warning the leaders of a country to turn back to God, to worship God, to get rid of idols. Um, and if the leaders of the country don't change what they're doing, then the country will suffer. It's very easy for the people who are not leaders to blame the leaders for everything that goes wrong. To say, God warned you, if you had followed God better, this wouldn't have happened. Like, this is your fault. And, and that makes us the ordinary citizens feel pretty good about ourselves it's the leader's fault not mine in Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 1 and 2 um, Ezekiel highlights another excuse that the people were using. They, they weren't so much just pointing at the leaders. In fact, many of those taken to Babylon probably had been leaders in Jerusalem. And so their excuse was, was a different, not so much pointing um, at the king or, or, or others in power, but 
pointing to previous generations and blaming them for what had gone wrong. People are suffering today. We're here in Babylon in exile because previous generations messed up. They were the ones who turned away from God. They are the ones who turned the temple into a place of idolatry. They are the ones who oppressed the poor. And didn't God say, if you go back even to the Ten Commandments, didn't God say that he would visit the sins of the, chil- of the parents upon the children to the third and the fourth generations? Our suffering, they might say, doesn't mean that we need to do anything different than what we've always done. We're just reaping the consequences of our parents' ungodliness. Now, Ezekiel challenges the people here in chapter 18 to take personal responsibility. Let me read that for you. The word of the Lord came to me. What? Do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That's a little strange for us, not much of a proverb. What does it mean that the children's teeth are set set on edge? Well, basically, it's blaming previous generations for today's problems. And, And it was so common, it had become a proverb. Parents eat sour grapes. Now, when you eat something sour, your face puckers up, you you screw up your face, you you perhaps want to spit it out. It's nasty. And the proverb says the parents eat sour grapes, but the kids are the ones, the later generations, the ones that screw up their face, that get that taste in their mouth. That was the proverb. Parents eat sour grapes, kids pucker up their face or the children's teeth are set on edge and so they're they're blaming parents in Jerusalem sin children are taken into exile in Babylon but God is very clear that that thinking that attitude just isn't going to stand have a look in verse 3 it continues As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. And then down in verse 20, we explicitly read again. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. This might sound like common sense to you. The the one who does the wrongdoing will receive the punishment for that wrongdoing. But... Think about it, as we approach an election in this country, there's a lot of finger pointing going on, isn't there? Uh, That government leader, he's responsible or she's responsible for this and for that. And, And some of the things are good. This one says, I'm responsible for the share market being up. I'm responsible for lower crime. I'm responsible for, but there's also plenty of blame. You're responsible for You've messed that up. People are living because of living in whatever struggle because of you. And so we, we recognize that the people in power do impact our lives, do impact our living conditions, do impact uh, concept, have consequences. Their decisions have consequences for us. We also recognize if we take an issue like racism that we live with the consequences of previous generations. We live with the the consequences of their decisions, consequences of their actions. However, these things impact us. However, we remain responsible for our own decisions and our own actions. There may well be institutions that are corrupt, but we have a choice 
whether or not we participate and uh, support those institutions. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. To those adrift and living in exile, despairing of their situation, God says, things are bad now. <laughs> it's supposed to be bad. This is punishment. It's not supposed to be good. But you better shape up. You better acknowledge your wrongdoing. You better acknowledge where you have messed up or things will get much worse for you. And so if you think, hey, we can just drift along. This is punishment. I can get used to living in Babylon. God says, no, you need to turn back to me. You need to repent. You need to, to, to make things right or things will get worse. Now, that's a pretty grim message. Hey, you're sick, but if you don't take your medicine, you'll get sicker. That, that's not particularly encouraging. But Ezekiel has some good news for us as well. Just as our individual futures are not totally determined by past generations, certainly things that have happened either in the past in our lives or the past generations uh, influence the future, influence the path, the decisions, the values that we have. But not totally. And so just as that nationally is the case, it's also the case in my life. I have an opportunity to make good decisions. Ezekiel continues in verse 21. But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them. Because of the righteous things they have done, they will live. God doesn't invest all this effort into the ministry of Ezekiel just to tell people that they're going to be punished, just to make people feel bad about themselves, just to grind them, rub their noses in the mud. He wants his people change. He wants them to, to turn around no matter their wickedness. If they're hearing this message, it's not too late for them to make things right, to come back to God, to turn away from idols, to, to treat people justly and righteously. God says, do it. Come back. We can make things better. And so this message so far should, should really um, relate to us. Maybe not the whole Babylon thing, but, but it should relate to us. Because when we find ourselves adrift... It's very easy to start spending our energy pointing at others. As I mentioned earlier, the, the election season actually encourages us to spend our energy pointing fingers at others, at bad decisions, at mistakes, at things that have gone wrong. And so rather, God says, use this time where you're drifting Use this time where, where things are uncertain, where the future isn't clear. Use this time to inspect yourself, to examine our own lives. Do I have sinful attitudes that need to change? Have I done things that, that hurt other people that I need to make right? I know that most of us watching today are are willing to admit, hey, I'm not perfect. Nobody is. I'm human. Well, that's great. That's a terrific start, God says. If you're adrift and you can say that, then, then you're, in, you're, you're taking the first steps. But that's really lazy. <laughs> I mean, it, it's lazy to say, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. That, that, that didn't take any thought. That didn't take any honesty or any introspection on your part. 
Ezekiel tells us that we need to take responsibility for those imperfections. Now, I don't know exactly what that's going to mean for you, but it might mean something like actually getting out a piece of paper and a pencil and writing down what those things are that you're not perfect in. And what are those things that are temptations to you that you give in to more than you really want to acknowledge? What are those attitudes that you have that you know just aren't really pleasing to God, but you've got used to living with? What are those sins that you know are part of your life that you, you secretly, if you were to stop and, and sit, you, you would feel ashamed of? Maybe this is a time for you to, to put that list down. It doesn't even have, I'm not saying that the list is 20 things wrong. It might be two. But once you've written those down, the next thing to do is say, what's the next step? And write that down. You know, look, we have taken a long time, many years of practice. We've gotten good at being bad. It's struggling. These, these struggles, these temptations, these sins, these attitudes, they didn't just pop up yesterday. We've been nurturing them for a long time, maybe wrestling them. And, and so they're not going to change overnight. I'm not going to say, hey, by this next Sunday when you come back, you should be an overcomer of those things that you've just written down. But we do need to take the next step. What's one thing? that we can do to turn that around, to get back to God. You see, it took many, many steps for Israel to go from David to the destruction of Jerusalem. It took more steps to go from Jerusalem as a captive over to Babylon. And to undo that, Israel was going to take a lot of years, a lot of time, a lot of different different things. God said, hey, you've got 70 years. That was the message of Jeremiah last week. You've got 70 years to, to, to think about this. Go to your room and think about this, says God. You've got 70 years. They weren't going to snap their fingers and suddenly be completely godly and forget how to sin. And we're not going to either. We need to be patient but persistent in turning things around with God's help. And so while we're doing that, while we're thinking about this, Ezekiel has one last word for us. In verse 23, he gives the, reminds us of God's character, of who God is. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked declares the Sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? You see, I think sometimes our picture of God is that He, he is just watching us, waiting for us to, to trip up, waiting for us to, to sin. And, and, and here He tells Ezekiel, Ezekiel, do you think that I enjoy punishing people when they're wicked? Not even when they make a mistake. When they're wicked, do you think I enjoy punishing them? Some of us would, right? We would enjoy or, or at least think that was the right thing to have happen. This is good when the wicked are punished. That's the way it should be. God says, do you think I enjoy that? And the answer is no, because he contrasts it and he says, rather, Am I not pleased? What is it that pleases him? When they turn from their ways and live. When they turn from their ways and live. You see, that's what living is. Living is turning from uh, the old ways, the sinful ways, the ungodly ways, and, and following God, reconciling with God. That's true life, and that's what pleases God. Now, it's not as though everything that's broken can be made right in your lifetime or mine. 
But God is working. God is at work to redeem us, to bring us from Babylon back to a reconstructed Jerusalem. So much of Ezekiel is quoted often in Revelation. And Revelation has this picture of a glorious new Jerusalem. And that's what Ezekiel is looking forward to. God is working to redeem, to restore, to recreate Israel, the world, and us. And so I know we can't have an invitation over the, uh, over the computer. Um, come to the front of your living room um, if this message is connected with you. That, that doesn't work. But I do want you to hear an invitation from God. God invites you to, to talk with Him. To, to share. Don't, don't just write those things down on paper and stick them in your pocket. Write them down on paper and then pray over them. Ask for God's Holy Spirit to help you, to strengthen you, to guide you, to, to direct you in ways that you can overcome, into new habits, into new um, ways of thinking. God invites you to, to examine your life. He invites you to, to stop drifting and commit yourself to following Him, to, to taking steps with Him towards a new Jerusalem. To walk with Him on His mission of hope and of recreation. And I hope that that's something that, that captivates your imagination. That when things are dark, when things are hopeless, when we don't know where to go, that God, provides us with a direction and it's back to him.